Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Just Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Just Dave. There's no other Daves in AA, is there? Um, Dave K, for anybody taking notes or keeping track. Um, you know, I like to congratulate the celebrants, first of all. Um, you know, one of the things I always love about celebration is it's, it's a sign of hope. It's that uh, small sign of hope of somebody coming in and seeing that it is actually possible, uh, even though we don't have an indication of what's possible or what we have to do to, to reach that goal, we see somebody with a year. I know with me coming in, I couldn't get more than 30 days in five years. 30 days, and I hear people saying, I have a year. My first reaction is, you're lying. <laughs> you know, all right, you, you look like crap. You're drinking every day, aren't you? Um, I honestly, I went to a meeting, and... Uh, and they gave me a coffee commitment. And this is how insane I, you know, it is, but they gave me a coffee commitment. They said, if you, if you make coffee, you, you'll get 90 days. This person had the coffee commitment before you and is celebrating 90 days. And I looked at him and I thought, you're lying. <laughs> There's no way you have 90 days because I can't get 90 days. But I, I, I did take the coffee commitment and I would make coffee every Wednesday. I would drink the entire week before. But something was bringing me back to that meeting to make the coffee. I would stop like two days before to detox. Um, I would, you know, I would show up. I, I uh, would make the coffee. I'd leave and start drinking. Not sharing with anybody what's going on, but wanting to be a part of that hope, wanting to be a part of a community that I was not a part of any community outside of that meeting. I was isolated in my room for three years, drinking with the shades drawn, the lights out. Um, me and a bottle of vodka. Uh, I had I had resigned to not driving so I wouldn't get a DWI. You know that brilliant uh, resolution that we come to. You know, oh, I don't want to get a DWI, so I won't drive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll stay home and drink. And I would get my cigarettes, my booze, lock the door. I didn't want my roommates to see me drunk. Didn't want them to know I was drinking. I thought I was so sly. You know, but when your room smells like vodka and urine for three days, you know, it's kind of hard to hide that. But there was some hope that, that I knew that maybe, you know, it was true. Maybe there was a possibility. Maybe there was something out there that I could do. Because I knew the way I was living was not the way I should be living. I knew the way I was living was not what we would call normal, but... Why that was, I wasn't 100 percent sure when I started going to meetings. All right. one, one of the um, the things that you know you've mentioned uh, the sign, you know, the vodka ad, and uh, just just uh, recently I went to dinner with somebody, and uh, you know they didn't really know my whole alcoholic situation. I don't really hide it. I'm I'm pretty probably bore people from talking about it so much, but. Um, they said about halfway through the meal, does this bother you? And I literally had to look at what they were talking about, you know, like the candle, the, what, what, the check. What, I don't understand what, what is going to bother me. And I looked and it was a, a glass of wine. It didn't even dawn on me that they had ordered it. It didn't dawn on me that it was sitting there. It didn't dawn on me that I have a problem with it. I was neutral. All right. One of the greatest promises to me is the 10 step promises. Um, and it says, and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. And I love how they hyphen it there. It kind of goes back to the, the, the hyphen in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first step with we are powerless over alcohol and our lives are unmanageable. It's kind of like, you know, okay, there's this alcohol thing, but there's a little more. And then at the 10th step, they say, well, you know, we've now solved all your problems. Oh, and by the way, that thing you came in for, alcohol, yeah, that's solved too. Isn't that great? Or is it just me? All right. So, for by this time, sanity will have returned. Sanity. What is the insane thought? They talk about the insane thought. The insane thought is that somehow, some way, I can drink like a normal drinker. It haunts me, okay? 
I think that I'm going to be able to cross that line again. I've crossed it where I'm an alcoholic now. Maybe I can go back and be a normal drinker. So the insane thought would be if I see alcohol is I can drink normal. All right? The sanity is that if I see it, I run away. Or I say, you know what? That's not a choice. Or I'm neutral. But that's a sane thought when it comes to alcohol. An insane thought is I can drink one and get away with it. I can drink one and stop tomorrow. I can drink one and the rest of my life next week. I can drink one. I did it for five years, and every time I drank one, three days later I'm driving in a blackout. We'll seldom be interested in liquor. Seldom. Isn't that a beautiful promise? I thought about it every single minute of every single day for all the time I was drinking. If tempted, we recoiled from it like a hot flame. The actual opposite of what I was doing. If I saw it when I was in the grips of it, I would run for it. I would think about, how am I going to get that? Is there enough just for me? How am I going to get rid of these other people sucking it down? Can I drink all night? Do I have to really go to work tomorrow? You know? Can I quit my job? You know, I'll find another one. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this happens automatically. Automatically. Okay? To me, that's a beautiful promise. Now, I have to admit, um, there's a lot of information. I'm talking about uh, working with others. There's a lot of information in here, and I was sharing with somebody before. My, my plan today was I went through, I highlighted all these different chapters, and I, went, I was going back and forth and wrote notes. And on the way here, I'm like, where's my book? <laughs> um, so, best laid plan, you know, God had a different opinion. Um, I have plenty of experience, I have plenty of, uh, that I can share with you uh, that, would, that would be just as fine, I'm sure. Um, one of the, there's two areas that I like to touch on when I'm working with another person and about working with others, and that's in Bill's story. Um, Bill, you know, very, in a very simple and nice way, lays out him and Abby. You know, it's from eight pages eight and on. He lays out, you know, his meeting with Abby and how he got sober from that point, okay? Um, it's a much simpler version than, you know, in, in the chap- chapter working with others is more or less a lot of different um, situations you might run into, kind of like they lay out the ninth step. They give you a lot of ninth step uh, amends, and they give you almost every situation possible. That's kind of what they do also with the uh, working with others. So um, I could go through the entire chapter, which would take a long time, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm going to break down, for me, the basics of what I try to do, the flavor of, uh, of working with others, Okay. Now, when I first came in, uh, which was in 19, around 1993, I think, um, my sobriety day is January 11th, 1997, but in 1993, um, uh, you know, I was part of a, a group, I was going to meetings, I was in an outpatient program at that time, uh, I entered by mistake, um, uh, my, my father had been in the program uh, all my life, and he was uh, relapsed and when his, was in an outpatient program, and my mother was going to the family group, and I came home with a real horrible problem. You know, um, this this woman had ruined my life by not you know breaking up with me, and uh, so that was you know this monumental drama. And my mom suggested, well, "Why don't you go talk to this counselor?" I went and talked to the counselor and explained to my huge problem with relationships, and uh, he gave me this test. Okay, I'll take the test. And uh, and after I took it, he said, well, you know, unfortunately you pass and uh, you're an alcoholic. And uh, I'm like, wait a second, I didn't come here for this. <laughs> I've got problems because my dad's an alcoholic. Um, so uh, reluctantly I decided, I agreed to outpatient. You know, I agreed to outpatient. And part of the outpatient was going to meetings. So I went to meetings. I was very open to, you know, self-evaluation. It's like uh, I'd been in therapy. You know, all these things I'm not afraid of. Um, But my point is, when I arrived at AA, I really had no handle on my powerlessness or alcoholism. But I was willing to be a member. I was willing to raise my hand and say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I was willing to raise my hand and say, yeah, I'm an idiot. 
you know, anything that would allow me to be a part of this group, be part of a fellowship I was willing to do. But deep down in here, there was not a real big understanding. Now, jumping forward today, when I'm working with others, when I was in that group, when somebody walked in and said, I'm new, automatically my thought was, I have to keep them here. That person came in, they want help, they must be an alcoholic, let me try to keep them here. Regardless of whatever they were saying, regardless of the, what they were doing in their actions, I felt it was my responsibility as an AA member to keep people in the room. It was like a recruitment drive. All right? Yeah. I got Tupperware, you know, at the end of the year for bringing in as many alcoholics as I can. You know? It's not a bad thing. Okay? I'm showing compassion. I'm truly getting out of myself. However, what I'm doing is possibly intervening with their path. If anything you get from me today is that I carry the message, I don't, I am not the message, I am not, the, I do not get people better, I do not intervene with them, I do not manipulate them, I do not, I just present. I pray to God that something happens and they get some kind of solution, but I, I can't take responsibility for either their success or failure. Okay? That would just give me way too much power, and believe me, I would eat it up. I've done it. I've done it, okay? Um, and, and I see it. So, so people are coming in, and I would go over and I'd be like, hey, what are you, how are you doing? And they're like, yeah, I don't know if this is really for me. Well, just keep coming back. Come on, guy, keep coming back. You know? And uh, I say, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't really have a ride. I'll pick you up. Come on. What are you doing? Don't give up. Just keep coming back. And, you know, they would say, well, how do you do it? I just keep coming back. You know? And I was as loony as, uh, loony as a tune, you know? And I am... <laughs> I'm living at my parents' house in the bed I grew up in, you know, and I'm telling the neighbors I'm just saving to buy a house. Um, I had no money, you know, but I'm telling everybody I'm saving to buy a house because uh, here I am again at 32 at home, and, um, and I'm going to meetings. I'm constantly going to meetings. One good thing is I'm always going to meetings, um, and I'm surrounded by people. My first sponsor was a guy that just seemed like a lot of fun. He was cool. He had all women around him and everything, you know? He was the guy I would hang out with when I was growing up or hanging out at bars. That's my attraction to him. So obviously, what did I get from that? I got what I was seeking. I got a lot of fun, <laughs> but not a lot of sobriety. All right? And I quickly relapsed. Um, again, none of this is bad. I believe there's a journey that all of us take. The, the misconception we have is that everybody arrives at the same place at the same time. And if they don't, there's failure. If they do it, it, earlier, it's success. There's no failure. There's no success in this whole thing. It's all, we're all on individual journeys. And we're trying to come to our conclusion or the light of the truth. Okay? At 14, I easily could have qualified. Okay? 14 was my first blackout. Um, I, you know... I easily could have walked in A and said, I'm an alcoholic. I, when the police, four policemen find you in your own vomit in town, all right, I'm not, that's not an occasional drinker, all right? So um, from the time that I'm 14 to the time that I stopped at 32, really what the journey was was to come to my truth. And that truth was that I was powerless over alcohol, all right? Now, even though I went to AA in the early 90s, doesn't necessarily mean I came to that truth. I really was looking for how can I become a, a normal drinker? How can I be a casual drinker? How, what I was refusing to accept was that some days, you know, that I can't pull that out of my back pocket at some point because I need it for relief. It's the only solution I've ever had in my life that gave me any kind of relief. Don't tell me I can't have it the rest of my life. So... I'm going to meetings and I'm playing with this idea. I'm toying with this idea and my mind's playing with this. So even though I wasn't ready or I wasn't at that point does not mean that it was wasted time. Does not mean that any approach anybody made to me didn't click. I hit different layers. I hit different levels. 
I wasn't, I was an atheist when I came in. That took years to even get to. Um, but I, I was getting a foundation of fellowship, which was really important to me. I spent three years alone drinking. Okay. Just people hugging me was something. Just people calling me on the phone was encouraging. Okay. That even stopped me from drinking at times when I was down and out and ready to take that drink. I didn't want to lose those friendships. I didn't want to lose what I had gained to that point. So they had their place, even though it wasn't, you know, what we would say is in the steps or in the book or in the, you know. Um, so that was early on. I thought, just let's be encouraging. Later on, I've learned, I've learned different. Okay. Um, my, the, what happened with me is that I got a sponsor really great. Um, I, uh, I was still dealing with the God thing, but I was going to meetings. He was, um, taking me the steps through the steps slowly, which again is what he learned and how he did it. There's no right and wrong. I can't, I can't judge that as right or I can't judge that as wrong because it helped me for what I needed to get through at that time. All right. He sat with me every single night at the end of the, after my meeting to make sure that I was okay before I went home because I would wait for all the liquor stores to close. He opened up his home to me to sit on his couch to wait for the liquor stores to close. So he was supportive and compassionate and kind, um, even though you know he wasn't what we would call a step you know nut. All right. But so he presented that to me. Um, unfortunately, what happened is because now I don't have a foundation in God, I have a foundation in my sponsor. And when you have a foundation in your sponsor, what happens is if you get in an argument, now my foundation's gone. My higher power walked out. OK, my higher power moved. Um, so I was put in a real turmoil. I was put in a tailspin. And that's when I sought my next sponsor, which happened to be Chris, who's shared here. Um, he was giving a workshop. I hit a, an emotional bottom. Now, could anybody have caused that? Could anybody have, you know, sat, sat down, giving me exercise, and all of a sudden I have an emotional breakdown, and now I'm looking to do the steps? No. You know, no. Could anybody have, you know, shared with me their experience with having an emotional breakdown? And I said, ah, I never want to have that happen to me. I better avoid that. Let me do the steps. No. Because they did, okay? I had to experience everything that I experienced in order to get to the place that uh, gave me the incentive or drive to either let go of or to pursue. I let go of more than I pursued, okay? Preconceptions, um, misunderstandings, um, you know, beliefs, reality, whatever. I let go of a lot more than I pursued. So when I'm working with the guys today, all right, let me tell you where I'm at today working with guys. Um, about two years ago, what happened with me was um, in 2005, my father passed away suddenly. And at that time, he was taking care of my mother. Um, it didn't even dawn, it wasn't even a, a hesitation. I moved in to help my mother. Um, you know, she had dialysis three days. She needed, she didn't drive, you know, she just needed support like that. So I moved in to help my mother. A year and a half, um, I was taking care of her. Um, I was working full time, taking care of her at night. And you can tell meetings really suffered. <laughs> meetings started really slipping side, uh, by. Um, whether it was because I didn't have time or whether I actually just was full of self-pity uh, and didn't want to see anybody, you know, I don't know. But um, the reality is I fell back on my program. So she passes away. At the time she passes away, um, I kind of I took some time. I took I, I you know enjoyed myself, and then it, it hit me. I'd gotten so far away that I needed to dive back into this program. Now, one of the things that I I look back at is I really look back at early AA. I really reviewed my own program, the program around me, and I started thinking back to the early AAers. Much more success. How did they do it? What are they? What were they doing differently? And one of the things that I realized was back then it was a lot more um, localized. People went to meetings. They were probably from the same town. 
Um, everybody probably knew each other growing up from high school. They knew each other's drinking careers. They knew the trouble that they were in. Um, it was a lot more understanding of the individual, and there was a lot more day-to-day -day interaction. There was a lot more seeing everybody every day, you know, and, and, uh, and realizing how they're living. Having said all that, um, I decided I needed to dive back into the program. Well, at the time, I was giving a workshop, or I was helping my sponsor do a workshop at a sober house. And uh, I was sponsoring a couple of the guys at the sober house. And the owner said, jokingly, why don't you get a room? Hmm. Bastard. You know. Because I'm the type of person that, you know, it starts getting in my head, and I start thinking, and I'm like, all right. Yeah. And then it got down to, that's not a bad idea. Okay? Um, it's not a bad idea. And so uh, in November of 2007, I moved in. Uh, one of the, and I'll, and I'll share with you the benefits of that. Um, one of the benefits is that I can't hide. Uh, they can see how I live. Now, I am not saying I live like a saint. Like maybe they see me living like a, a, a disaster every single day, but they see how I live. It steps my game up, okay? Um, I have access 24-7, which helps... Uh, and I have a, a guy I work with here, and I'm like looking at him every time I say something. You know, like, is that true? You know? <laughs> don't you, don't talk to anybody after this meeting about anything I said. Um, so, it, not only does it allow them to see me and call me on my stuff, it allows it also allows them access to me, not just at meetings. I realized when I was sponsoring guys that I would see them maybe once a week at a meeting. We would talk, and then they would go home. Some guys I sponsored in the past, I didn't even know where they lived, all right, let alone their wife or their kids. Now I know exactly where they live, you know, maybe across the hall, and I can see how they're living. And a lot of times I find that my, my um, guidance, my mentorship, I like to call it more of a mentorship, my mentorship comes from um, the nonchalant smoking on the porch, Three o'clock in the morning, they're struggling. Guys, I don't even sponsor. I'm just giving advice or giving, uh, you know, li listening to what they have to say. That's that's what it's about. Giving compa This is not about the steps. This is about my relationship with my higher power, their relationship with their higher power, us coming together with a common solution and a common problem: love, compassion, humility. All these things don't say, call your sponsor every day, you know, at two. Okay? Um, if When I was reading uh, Ebby and Bill, you know, Bill goes through the steps that he took with Ebby, and none of it says that, you know, he sat down, he called Ebby every single day, and Ebby told him what to do, and, you know, when he had a problem, he, he went to Ebby, and, and none of that. It all goes, when he had a problem, he pointed to God took a moment, got guidance, not from Ebby, from God. You know, it's unfortunate we shy away so much from God. My first group, home group, you know, they voted to take the third and seventh step prayers off the wall because they said God in them. They were scared of the word God, you know. You know, maybe in some way because that took out the control they had, but, you know, they were scared to point people towards God. My, my experience is that I had to get to a place of desperation that I don't care what you told me as long as it was a solution. I was an atheist, but I was open and willing to accept the concept because I had nothing else. Maybe in 93 I wouldn't have accepted that. Maybe in 93 I would have run away. And I did. But in 93 I didn't have the desperation I had in 97. In 93, I was still fighting just the, even the concept. In 93, I still thought I was young enough or I, I was tough enough or there was just a, it was a phase I was going through. But it's all, all struggles I had with my own personal powerlessness. All right? So understanding that, what's most important for me right now is that I, I talk to people and I find where they are with their powers, powerlessness. Number one, straight up. That's the first thing that we work on. 
We don't even talk or discuss the rest of the stuff. When I go to rehab and detox to talk, I have a commitment. When I go there now, all I talk about is one, two, and three. I used to talk about my story or the steps or whatever. And this is on my own personal decision. But what I found is maybe sometimes we give too much information. We have people in detox and rehab that have never heard the detailed description or discussion about powerlessness. This book has the first 43 pages are on powerlessness. Okay? So it's got a little weight in the program itself. And it talks about without, you can't even go on unless the individuals hit that bottom, that hopelessness. You know, Bill said, I'm hopeless. And then the next thing you know, he's getting better. So the, the thing I try to stress on is get, <laughs> this sounds cruel, but I'm trying to get them hopeless. I'm trying to get them to a point where they understand how messed up they are, how screwed they are because they're this powerless. If they understand that, then I spring on them that there is, by the way, a solution to that. And we understand. But what I stress is get to a fellowship. I don't care what A it is. Just as long as there's an A at the end of it, you know, go. Okay? I am not... I can't take the responsibility for every individual that's in that rehab or detox. If I could, then I would tell them my program and exactly how I would do it. But it would be unfair to me give them my program then send them out to another program and for that person to contradict anything I said or to disagree with anything I said. We're trying to build hope here. We're trying to build willingness. We're trying to build, you know, at least the, the desire to come in. So I just want them to get to somebody or group that can help them and then let them grow the relationship. Let them introduce the program to them. Let them work on the rest of the stuff. My job, I believe, when I'm going out speaking and things like that is just to get down to the, 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 the common disease and the common solution, the introduction of the common solution. I don't know if that was really complicated. It's just what came to my head that i got to talk about, all right? That's my soapbox, all right? So when I'm working with a guy, I sit down and we talk about the physical. Right away I have him read doctor's opinion and we talk about the physical. Then we move on to the mental obsession. I generally find in the, in the halfway house, in the, in the sober house, we have about 50 residents. In the sober house, I find that one of the biggest misconceptions is the physical part of it um, and, or the spiritual aspect of it. But I can't introduce the spiritual aspect of it until I talk about the mental obsession and the understanding of the insanity. Um, and I talk about the insanity and why the mental obsession continues to, to dog them about the only solution they ever knew. And that's basically because of the spiritual malady. Very basic. I don't get into God. I don't get into all of that. I just try to put it in layman's terms. One of the biggest helps is in the back. There's a, a in the appendix is called the spiritual experience. If you haven't read it, read it. The reason I suggest that is because it's a very basic layman's terms on what a spiritual experience is. It kind of takes the, the mystic out of it. It kind of takes that aura of Bill's story with the white light. And it is helpful to have that discussion and have them read it and say, hey, what do you think of that? What are you, what are you thinking? Do you really understand what a spiritual experience is? It's, it's really a vital change. It's this, a dramatic change in your personality and in your thinking. And we're trying to affect that change. All right? Um, and once we get to that point, if they're willing, willing to move on, then we move on. Now, something that I've changed over time is that I used to, um, I used to kind of have a timeline. I used to have a kind of a, an opinion on how long it should take them or what they should be doing or what... And I've kind of backed off from that. And the reason being is I can't make an assumption of God's plan for that. That would really give me way too much weight and uh, understanding. I'm not, I ain't that smart, all right? I'll tell you right now, I ain't that smart. Anybody think I'm lying, then come up and I'll prove to you I'm not that smart. Um... 
even though I have the tools, sometimes we get way caught up into too much into the mechanics. The solution is not in the mechanics. The mechanics are a process to try to get the person to a solution. The solution is not in me. I am the hope. I am the, the person that can try to get them enthusiastic about the solution, can try to guide them to the solution, can try to mentor them while they get to the solution. However, I'm not the solution either. So I can't make the assumption that I know when and where that should happen for them. The mantra that I try to carry into this is that I have to have patience, tolerance, and love, and compassion. So what I try to do is I try to be, um, I try to be as standoffish as possible. I present the information and then I let them do what they're going to do. Um, this has led to, you know, I sometimes question it. Sometimes I, you know, I try to push them onto somebody else. Maybe I'm just not helping you in the way that I need to help you or whatever. However, I have found that there's a much more, um, uh, there's much more of a, uh, of a chance that they'll come back to me if I don't push them. If I don't ruin the relationship or the friendship, then there's, there's more apt to come back to me and talk to me if they really get into trouble. Um, and there's uh, more of a chance that uh, we, you know, if I don't push it, that they will continue the relationship. And I can actually still help them by not doing, not in other ways. I can help them in other ways. Okay? So I try to keep that relationship open and going, and I don't judge, and I don't push, and I don't prod, and I can, you know, if they come, chances are, you know, they'll come in and they'll say, I've got this huge problem, we'll talk about it, and I'll say, okay, do the work, you know, like, and they're going to say, I know what you're going to say, yeah, do the work, you know, so um, I will keep pushing them, but I won't, I won't say you're fired if you don't do this in a week, or, or you know, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. I know what works for me, and I know what works for most people. I know what works for somebody else. But I can't tell you I have all the answers. I just try to give as best as I can the, the guidelines that I've had. Now, having said that, um, I, I want to give you an analogy. In here, they use the, the description, um, and I don't know if everybody, everybody understands it, uh, when they're talking about God, you know, God is the principal, I am his agent. That's an insurance term, okay? Um, it means God's the, you know, the boss, and I'm kind of his agent, I, I represent him. So imagine that, um, let's say I have an insurance company, and I won't use any particular name, but let's say it's Mall State, okay? And so I go to Mall State, and, uh, and I want home insurance. And I go to an agent, and the agent says, okay, we're gonna, this, is our, this is Mall State's home insurance. And uh, I read it, and I really like it, and I say, okay, I want that. And, uh, and he says, okay, and this, it's this much money. Right, I go home, and I feel comfortable that I'm covered. And then there's a flood, and I call my Mall State agent, and I tell him I had a flood. And he said, oh, well, you're not covered with a flood. And I said, well, I read it. And it told me that I'm covered in a flood and in, in the mall state insurance. They said, oh, well, you know, that's the mall state insurance. I decided that I'm going to give you my insurance, the Dave insurance. Because the Dave insurance works for me. It's not as comprehensive as the mall insurance, but the Dave insurance works for me. Okay, so you're going to come to my house. You're going to give me the money. Oh, well, we don't have the money. We don't have time right now to come out and help you. Um, I, I've never had floods, so I really don't know how to help you. Um, I don't have that experience, uh, but um, thanks for playing. <laughs> kind of a strange analogy, but the point is that, you know, as a representative, I have to represent the program, God's program or the program, the program that I've accepted as the program of recovery, um, not my interpretation. Not even though maybe I don't do everything I need to represent the entire program um, or I'd be falling short of being an agent. I would be my own principal. Does that make sense? Okay. So I try to take me out of the equation. How do I do that? When I start working with a guy, I, tell, I, I sit down with them and we go through the book line by line. Um, well, that's a lot doctor's opinion, I don't do line by line, but after the doctor's opinion, I go line by line. Um, when I do that, I try to use a new book, okay? 
And the reason I do that, and this is a conclusion I came to myself, I started hearing people going, yeah, I picked my sponsor because they had, they had this book that was just beat up and disheveled, and it was, everything was highlighted. Okay. Well, I looked down, and I had a book that everything was highlighted. All right? You know, and I realized that those highlights were for me. Those highlights were my experience at that time for where I was at in my program, and that was my higher power telling me what was important and was going to stand out. Why would I make the assumption that that's what they need at that time and that point? Why would I make the assumption that it's something that would stand out to them or make sense to them? Why would I point out what was important to me, you know, 10 years ago? So I try to have a new experience every single time that I work with somebody. I, and I go into it saying, we are going to have an experience. Going into that brings much, a much greater light to the situation as far as I'm concerned. Because now I'm going into it not, I need to get you to this place, I need to keep you sober, I need to make you do the steps. I go into it going, huh, I have a new person and an opportunity to have a new experience. Regardless of the outcome. Regardless of what I think the outcome should be. The outcome is really, for me, from my standpoint, the outcome for me is that I'm sharing my experience, strength, and hope. That's it. I can't have any expectations. I've, my life has been proven time and time again. Anytime I have an expectation, I get nailed by my higher power. He smacks me right in the back of the head like a nun. You know, like, bam! Wake up, idiot! You ain't in charge! So going into it with that kind of mindset, with that feeling of, of um, that feeling, uh, just it, it, for me, it makes it a much better experience. Um, I know for me, and hopefully for them, because I'm not, we're not putting pressures on it. We're not putting um, undue exper- exper- uh, expectations on it. We're just having an experience. And I hope, I hope that that's, you know, what works best for them. Um, I don't have uh, a number um, uh, of how many people I work with and how many, you know, how many, how long that's going to be. Um, I've actually just, I've always gone with the headset that if it ever became too much, that I would stop. Uh, I would limit the number, and it's never became too much. You know, just when I think I'm getting to that breaking point, all of a sudden somebody leaves or somebody goes back out or. You know, and then a new person. It just always seems to work out. All right. Um, What it did lead me to, though, was last year uh, I realized how important this stuff was becoming in my life. Um, That uh, I was sitting at work and um, I was really I was struggling with something that uh, later on I did inventory on. But I was struggling with something and um, I was I was having a breakdown at work. And I realized I wanted to be helping others. I wanted to, this, there, I had a guy at the time that was in jail and his wife was calling me. We wanted to help me to help her bail him out. And I found myself going, I want to be there instead of here. I wanted to, I called out sick the next day and went and did that and had much better experience than sitting in my cubicle at work. So I realized that work had never, no longer been um, the place I needed to be. It wasn't bringing anything to me spiritually. All it was, was bringing was a paycheck. So I resigned. And I decided that I was going to go with faith and just pursue something that was more along the lines of my spiritual experience. Didn't know what that was. Um, and really kind of was winging it. But it felt right. Okay. And... Uh, and what happened was, uh, I think uh, six months later, a couple of guys um, that I know we started a company, sober construction company, um, and we're still in business. And we, you know, we're trying to hire guys that are trying to stay sober, that are in construction, and that just need some day work or just some money to pay rent or just some, you know. Um, and the the, the great information I'm getting back from them is it's like a meeting all day. They're, they're working with guys that are, they're having support and they're having a meeting. Now, does that mean that they're going to stay sober? No. Does that mean that, that that guarantees and they're going to get fired if they drink? No. It means that it's a supportive environment. You know, we understand. 
and we'll help you to 100%. You got, you got to go to a trial hearing? Fine. Take off. We understand. If you need to meet your probation officer, fine. We understand. You know, if you, if you, you know, we will support you the best way we can. Um, and that seems to be very helpful. Uh, so I've kind of thrown my entire life into uh, helping others in this program, um, which at this point is is what I needed. Uh, it could change next year. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it feels right right now. Um, I'm telling you, if you if you if anybody ever has the opportunity, I know it's it's a little insane, um, but I was fortunate enough not to have the the ties that wouldn't allow me. I sold everything and I moved into. I'm in the room, okay. I have I have a single room, uh, a little refrigerator, and you know what? I found after being there for two years that that's all I need. I I don't miss anything that is gone, okay. I actually want to get rid of some stuff in the room now. You know, it's a little, a little cluttered. I'm like looking to get rid of some more stuff. I mean, that's scary. But I was a guy about stuff. That's all, I, I gathered stuff, you know, for years. And now I don't need stuff. Um, but if you have the opportunity, it's, it's just really, it's nice. It's, 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 it's really intense. Um, but what I'm finding is that these places do not have the leadership and mentorship that they need. You know? You have houses that are filled with people dying for help, dying to try to stay clean and sober. And the, the, the person that's giving them the most mentorship has got like a year, you know, and they're looking They're You know, they're trying whether they succeed or not, you know, is, is not up to us, but they're looking, they're trying. And if there is, they're, they're thirsty for help. So if you go in there and, and people are there with some time, maybe some experience they're, they're they'll suck it up, you know. Um, but it hell, I think we need to find some, you know, maybe a little more balance, maybe fine. And those are the places that I'm finding more guys to work with. When I go to meetings now, um, like I said, and when I'm there, I'm meeting families. I'm getting to know more about their lives. Um, I'm really involved with them a lot more than I ever was before. Uh, and I found that going to meetings, I just wasn't finding the, the, the thirst or the people that I need to work with. That's the only place that I found it. Um, so it's just a suggestion, but hopefully I uh, I covered the topic. Um, uh, hopefully I brought you a good meeting. And uh, again, congratulations to the celebrants. Uh, God bless and uh, have a good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.